Hi everyone, welcome again to another financial analysis video with myself, Moeed Amin, and my colleague, Ted Wayman. Today, we're gonna to be looking at a really interesting company, one that's very well known in certain communities and actually has done incredibly well uh, during the COVID pandemic. And that's a company called NVIDIA. For, for any of those of you who, who are not in the gaming industry, uh, not avid gamers like me, um, I am an avid gamer, sorry, that's what I meant to say. Uh, you know, NVIDIA essentially uh, design, um, uh, you know, pro uh, graphics processing units for the gaming and the professional markets. And they also design systems on, uh, you know, chips for mobile and the automotive industry. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, graphics cards such as GE Force is something that they're very famous for. Um, so really interested to see how uh, what the finances say about this company. Um, now, before we go into that uh, and, and stick around, because what we're going to look at are a couple of things. Number one, the share price. Now, if you invested five years ago, uh, you would have seen over a thousand percent return on your investment. Now, you might think, oh, well, that's five years. That's long term investors. Not necessarily so. If you invested a year ago, you would have seen a 200 percent return. So this is clearly a company that's doing something right. And uh, we're going to dig into those finances uh, and help us see what that kind of what kind of kind of tells us. Uh, the other thing to note is they are looking to acquire well, they're trying to acquire um, Arm Holdings, which is another chip designer based in the UK for 40 billion dollars. So they clearly have the power to do so uh, and the resources to do that. So uh, stick around. We're going to look into that in a bit more detail. Now, uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, as always. If you have a company that you'd like us to analyze for you, whether you're thinking about investing in them or you're thinking about selling to them, or maybe you have an interview coming up with them and you want to really impress people in your interview, do leave a note in the comments section. We will analyze your video, your company for you and let us know the context for why you're requesting that video. Um, and if you're a subscriber, you're going to save a lot of time because we'll inform you uh, YouTube will inform you of when your video comes out. So stick around for the analysis of this video. And remember, look, a lot of people come to us and say, well, you didn't look at the forward uh, implications of this business, the future, and you know, the contracts and what they're trying to do and it's baked into the price. Yep, that's in important to the investment thesis, but we're not looking at that. That is not the purpose for our videos. The purpose for our videos is to help as many people as possible become far more financially savvy and educated. Right. Too many people in the retail investment community are uh, following the hype and following what others saying. We're trying to give you that power so that you can make some fundamental financial analysis about the companies that you're thinking about investing in or doing business with. Doesn't mean it's the only thing you look at. Absolutely not. There's a whole of other area of things that you need to look at for your investment thesis. But this is very important and we're going to give you the power to do so. Um, so, Ted. Let's, uh, let's share what we've uh, found out about this company and, and help people kind of read some of these financial analysis uh, statements. Absolutely. Well, good to, good to see you, Moeed. And here we go. We're going to dive into their financial statements. As you said, uh, this is backward looking. So this is telling us what happened in the past. And we're going to be looking at 2021. Um, now, uh, that's not the whole of 2021, because uh, we are now on the 14th of January, and to be able to produce uh, uh, the accounts, e even um, uh, a company as good as uh, NVIDIA wouldn't be able to do that in 14 days. Um, so here we go. Let's uh, scroll down to the financial statements, um, and we're going to start off with the income statement. Here it is. Um, and so we notice that this is for the 31st of January 2021. So this is their year end. So we're looking at this column here. The first column is the 31st of January. Um, uh, and we are dealing in millions of dollars. OK, so uh, when you see uh, the revenue of 16,000, that is, of course, 16.7 billion dollars. So as you said, quite a big company. And the first thing we notice is also uh, big growth. Look at that. So uh, from 2019 to 2020, uh, it was pretty much flat, dropped off a little bit, and then it has grown significantly. Now, there's two ways you can grow a business like this. One of them is organically, where you just, you know, you sell more stuff to your existing markets or create new products and sell that to your existing customers, or uh, you can grow through acquisition. 
Um, and actually, these guys, um, uh, this growth, I think, is mainly through uh, acquisition of a company called uh, Melanix. Um, uh, and we will show you um, how, uh, how we can see that uh, through the uh, accounts in a minute. So there's the revenue, 16.7 uh, 16 billion. Um, the cost of generating that revenue, the cost of the actual things that they're selling, 6.2 billion, leaving them with a gross profit of six point, uh, sorry, 10.4 billion. That's a gross margin of 62%. Very, very high gross margin. For every $1 they uh, bill their clients, in effect, it costs them 40 cents uh, to provide uh, you know, whatever it is that they're selling, um, uh, and they get to keep uh, 60 cents. So pretty, pretty high margin. Um, R&D, uh, always interesting when companies uh, spit out their R&D, basically says, you know, we're not standing still. We realize the world is moving. Uh, we need to move quickly with it. And therefore, we're spending $4 billion on R&D. And then the kind of the cost of running the business, the, the SG and A, as it's known, that's sales, general marketing, HR, finance, rent rate, light heat, travel, entertainment, all that kind of other stuff, another $2 billion, leaving them with income from on their operations, uh, uh, their total um, uh, profit of about $4.5 billion, still 27%, still pretty profitable. There's a little bit of interest, tells me they've got a little bit of debt, but um, you know, they haven't got too much debt because you know, their interest cover, comparing those two numbers, um, uh, is, is very, very high, uh, and uh, they're paying a little bit of tax. Um, uh, in fact, quite a low rate of tax, surprisingly low. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly why that is, um, but obviously they've got some very good tax accountants. Um, uh, they're paying an effective rate of about 2%. Effective rate the previous year um, was um, uh, actual 6%, and they got a tax rebate uh, in the year before. So somebody's doing something right on the tax side, um, and their net income is $4.3 billion. Now, um, do, do notice this one here. So um, this is quite interesting in terms of the, uh, the earnings per share. So um, what we can see here is that the earnings per share has grown significantly. And again, that's going to be because of this growth in the, um, in the income, uh, the growth in the profit. Uh, let me just uh, highlight that. So the growth in the profit. So this growth in profit, uh, and that's driven by this top line growth, which is growth through acquisition. Um, also, just notice the difference between um, these two numbers. Um, just quite interesting to see um, the difference in the basic and the diluted. There's a, a 12 cents difference. Um, it's up from the previous year um, when there was only a seven cents difference. Now, basic is, you know, you take the existing shares uh, in issue, divide uh, uh, the net income. This is the net profit buy all those shares and it's kind of so if you own one share then effectively your share of that 4.3 billion is seven dollars and two cents this diluted says that there's lots of share options out there so a lot of the staff certainly the senior managers will have share options and if they exercise their share options there would be more shares in issue and therefore you as a shareholder would be diluted so it's always just worth keeping an eye on that diluted number and just looking at you know is the company awarding too many share options so uh, that's a kind of little caveat there um so pretty pretty profitable business let's look at the balance sheet see this kind of the strength of the business um first of all so here we are looking at the assets um and we notice in the current assets lots of cash now we're going to take that multiple securities number so multiple security numbers are effectively bonds um and this is investments uh, so bonds are you know effectively companies borrow money by issuing bonds companies with lots of cash like nvidia uh, they then buy those bonds it's a way of just parking spare cash so you can see from the previous year um uh, they only had you know they had a very small number of bonds um, and they had most of it in the cash and cash equivalents. Cash equivalent is things like a deposit account or a savings account that you have to give 30 days notice to. Um, uh, it's just a way of earning a slightly higher rate of um, a return on their cash holding. So we can take those two numbers together as effectively their cash. Cash receivable, inventories, um, uh, and some, you know, some other prepaid expenses. So what you'd, everything you expect to see in their current assets of $16 uh, uh, billion dollars. Um, looking at the non-current assets, these are the things that they need to run the business. They've got some property, plant and equipment. You'll see that's increased. Um, and this number here, goodwill. So goodwill 
if you remember, um, uh, arises on acquisition. So when we buy a company, if we pay more than the fair value of the net assets, uh, then the difference between what we pay, and what we get effectively, that's known as goodwill. OK, uh, and so the fact that that has increased significantly says that this company has uh, uh, grown through acquisition and that is going to drive a lot of that top line growth. So when we see a company that says its top line growth has grown by 53 percent, um, don't expect that 53 percent to happen every single year without them buying other companies. And of course, they're usually paying a premium for those companies and then they have to work much harder to extract the relevant value. So it's not the underlying business that's just growing uh, at 50%. Um, they've got some other intangibles uh, assets as well. So these are going to be things like software or patents or licenses, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there is our, um, uh, the assets all looking uh, uh, pretty healthy, lots of stuff full of cash. Um, on the, um, the liabilities side, um, there is a little bit of debt as we expected. So the debt, you'll notice the debt has gone up. Uh, I'm going to guess that they've raised debt to, to fund the acquisition. That's going to kind of be my, um, uh, my premise. Um, uh, and we'll see that in the cash flow statement. Um, there's a little bit of short term debt as well. That's not really a, a major problem. Uh, and you'll notice that um, these total current liabilities, these are things that they have to pay within one year. If we compare their current liabilities to their current assets, current assets, 16 billion, current liabilities, uh, uh, about 4 billion. You know, liquidity, just not an issue for these guys. So really, really strong balance sheet. You know, really, you know, not too much, some debt, but not too much debt, lots of cash, very high liquidity. Um, uh, and we can see um, the equity uh, by the shareholders uh, is about 16.9 billion. Uh, and uh, they've got lots and lots of retained um, earnings. Um, also, just notice here, um, Treasury stock. OK, now Treasury stock is uh, where they have bought shares in NVIDIA. So if you if NVIDIA buys shares in, I don't know, Amazon, for example, it'll appear in the assets as an investment. Uh, what this treasury stock is that they've been buying shares in NVIDIA. They've been buying back their own shares. Um, now, highlight that because you'll see that there's been a small increase, about a billion, is that, you know, if you have a company buying back its own shares, then it is creating demand for those shares pushing the share price up and it's taking those shares out of the market, which means that there are less shares in circulation uh, and therefore, you know, theoretically, the share price will go up as well. So, you know, you've got this kind of, you know, the share price is going up. Um, the alternative, you know, companies will argue this is a way of returning money back to the shareholders. Um, uh, the alternative, obviously, is dividends. Um, if you get a dividend, you get taxed on it. If you get a capital gain on your share, then that tax is deferred. So that's a kind of the argument for the company. But don't forget, lots of uh, executives will have stock options and they will benefit from a rising share price. So always just keep a, you know, you know, be aware of companies which are investing in a lot of treasury stock. Um, uh, or, or buying their own shares, Apple being a, a very good example. Um, but otherwise, you know, very, very healthy. So what I tend to do is I kind of, I compare these two numbers together. So um, uh, let's just clear these uh, uh, annotation. So, you know, I tend to kind of, you know, just take these two numbers uh, and almost add them together in my mind. So at the moment, it looks like retained earnings, 19 billion, that's the 18.9 billion, you know, $19 billion, that's the total amount of profit they've made ever since they started trading, but not yet given back to shareholders in the form of a dividend. But what they have done is they've given it back to shareholders in the form of buying back their own shares, 10.7 billion so in effect they've kind of been using uh, profits to buy back shares rather than distribute as a dividend um so there's the balance sheet let's go and have a look at the uh, uh we'll look at the um the, the movement in um retained earnings so this is um uh, uh here we go um so uh, here we see here's the retained earnings and the treasury stock so um, we can see there's the profit from uh, this. That's the profit for this year. That's the profit for last year and the profit for the year before that. And what you'll notice is that they are um, paying dividends. OK, now the dividends are pretty small uh, in comparison to the profit, um, but they are paying, you know, they are paying a consistent amount of dividend. Um, and then we're looking at this column here, which is the Treasury stock, uh, and we can see um, you know, that they, uh, they, they have been buying, um, you know, there's some, some tax um, uh, withholding uh, 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 implications here. Um, so they haven't really been buying back any of their stock uh, since uh, 2000 and a, uh, 2019 or 2018, year ended 2019 there. 
but you know i would tend to you know i'd almost kind of add this column and this column together uh, and, and, and take them uh, and think about them as one um Let's look at the cash flow statement. So cash flow, so top half the cash flow statement, regular viewers will be familiar with this, that we are taking the net income. The first thing we're doing is looking at how much cash are they generating. So uh, the net income up at the top, this is straight from the profit and loss account, which we were looking at earlier. Um, uh, and then we just make adjustments to it and turn it into the cash profit. So cash profit is positive, big, big tick. Uh, that's my favorite number. Regular viewers will know that, that you know, this is probably the most important number. If you're not generating cash, you're losing cash. If you're losing cash, uh, you will go out of business at some point. It's a question of when, not if. Um, so any company that's burning cash needs to you know, turn, it, turn it around and start generating cash. Anyway, um, so this is a positive number. It's uh, a, a reasonably high. The two big drivers of that are these two numbers here. So depreciation is a non-cash expense. That's absolutely fine. You'll find that in pretty much any uh, cash flow. Any company that has assets will depreciate them. Uh, and then we add back that depreciation to turn it into a cash. Um, however, you also notice there's some stock based compensation. So this is a cost to the business. If they are paying their staff in shares, that is a cost to the business, uh, but it's a non-cash cost because effectively they're using shares rather than cash to remunerate their staff. Um, scrolling down through the income, uh, through the cash flow down to the bottom, here it is. Now, um, again, we've come across this before. Um, this is the cash used in investing activities. That's a pretty high number, 19, you know, that's $20 billion. However, um, we need to eliminate these two numbers here. So, um, you know, this is prepared under uh, IFRS, um, uh, which is a kind of a, you know, reporting standard. You don't have to worry too much about that. Um, but it just says that, you know, if you invest in, in uh, these, these marketable securities, these bonds, then you have to show it as an investment activity in your cash flow. It's not an investment activity. It's these guys parking cash. I've got too much cash. I park it over here. Uh, and then when I need it, I take it out again. OK, so we need to kind of just basically just ignore this from the cash flow. So what do we see in the cash flow? They spent eight point five billion buying a Melanix um, and they've also, you know, investing, um, uh, you know, a little bit of extra cash, another billion in tables, chairs, property, plant and equipment, computers, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so you'll notice that this acquisition didn't happen in the previous years um, uh, and uh, may happen in the future. Moed, as you mentioned, in terms of their investment in arm holdings. And how did they fund that? Um, well, they issued debt. And so there we can see that the, the, the debt um, uh, is, is, is uh, being raised on the balance sheet. Um, uh, and, and there it is. Um, there's the dividends that they're paying. So that, as we said, they are, they are regular dividend payments. Um, uh, and uh, so they uh, basically raised additional cash uh, uh, from their financing activities, and they use that in order to um, fund uh, an acquisition. And maybe they're kind of testing the market. Um, if they are going to be buying um, ARM and they are going to be paying 40 billion, then that's going to be a fairly significant amount of money. Um, and they're going to probably you know, do that through debt and equity, and it's going to significantly change um, the balance sheet of this company. Um, always be slightly wary of companies uh, which are buying other companies. If they do buy arm holdings, they're going to pay a lot for it. It's going to be a very, very big premium. Um, uh, and uh, therefore, they, um, you know, they need to be able to extract value uh, from that purchase. And uh, lots of um, uh, acquisitions have a history of destroying value. Often they are driven by the CEO's ego uh, rather than the ability and AO. L, uh, Warner, tie, uh, the tie-up, the merger between those two companies, a very salutary uh, lesson where you took two companies, put them together, and the resulting company is worth less than either of the original two companies. So um, caveat uh, investor, I don't know what Latin is for investor. Um, uh, just a, a final point on uh, uh, down here is just to show that we got the cash and cash equivalents at the beginning of the period. Um, that's this number here, uh, and the cash and cash equivalents um, uh, sorry, that, uh, at the end of the period, um, uh, which is this number here, it looks like it's a massive drop. But again, this is just cash and cash equivalents and doesn't include these marketable securities. So you kind of need to include the marketable securities. So I can tell you that if you take the cash and the marketable securities at the beginning of the period, it's about 11 billion. And at the end of the period, it's about 11.6 billion. OK, so 
you know, at the end of the day, they, they've got the same amount of cash. So be really careful if you are reading these companies um, uh, not to kind of take the numbers at face value. You can't just stick these stuff into spreadsheets and kind of say, oh, it's lost a lot of cash. It hasn't. It's just got the cash. It's parked it over here uh, in, a, in a different form of, of investment. OK, but it's still basically cash and sell it like that because the bond markets are open. So there is our analysis of the company. Um, let's go and have a look at the share price as we um, uh, said we would. Um, so here comes the share price. Uh, and we can see that the share price has, well, you know, as you mentioned, Moeed, um, if you'd been an early investor in these guys, um, uh, then you'd have seen a very, very significant return on your investment. Um, uh, and uh, but that's always the benefit of hindsight. Uh, if only, if only, if only. Um, so let's look at it in sort of slightly more recent period. So this is over the year. Um, it's been rising significantly. It has come off the boil somewhat. Um, uh, so uh, since the sort of the late 2020, uh, uh, it has been um, uh, falling. Uh, sorry, late 2021, it has been um, uh, dropping off a little bit. Um, P ratio, 84 times earnings. That's expensive. That's you know that that is very very expensive. The dividend yield is incredibly low. Well, we'd expect that because it does have a dividend yield. It is paying a dividend, but the dividend is very very small. Market cap, uh, six hundred and eighty one billion dollars. Just to remind ourselves that the value of the balance sheet today is about sixteen point nine billion. So there's a lot of expectation for this company. So yes, they are profitable, um, and you know, yes, they are profitable, but, you know, a lot of that profit is baked into the share price. So I, I can't see, you know, certainly if you're a value investor, uh, then this is not going to be something that, you know, unless you know something that I don't, um, and, and if you do, then please do share your thoughts. Um, but I can't see this as a kind of, as a great value uh, investment play. This isn't a cheap a company. This is very, very expensive. It's very expensive for a reason. Um, and it looks to me like it's really kind of peaked out uh, uh, end of 2021. And it's just coming slightly off the boil. Um, you know, where's the next growth going to come from? You know, it's going to have to be growth for acquisition. Companies that grow through acquisition often pay too much. Salutary lesson, very good example there is Vodafone. Uh, who spent something like $170 billion uh, buying management uh, back in 1998-99 at the sort of height of the dot-com boom, uh, the technology and the telecom and media stocks before the whole thing went south. Um, and suddenly they realized that they'd overpaid and they spent, I mean, they're still writing down their assets today. So there's big impairment charges and big losses as the share price has kind of, kind of gone south um, all the way down. Now, I'm not going to say that that's going to happen to these guys, but just, you know, do be aware um, that, you know, if you're buying into this company, you know, where is that future growth coming from? Uh, uh, 84 times earnings is, you know, a yield of just over 1%. Uh, if it doesn't grow, it's going to take you 84 years uh, to get your money back. Um, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, is that, you know, is that a worthwhile um, uh, investment? So there's my kind of my, my feelings uh, on, uh, on, on NVIDIA, um, Moeed. Yeah, great. I, I would love to hear, you know, anyone's thoughts on uh, what we just said there. I mean, like I said, this is a, this is not about predicting the future. This is about helping you analyze the past uh, and, and based upon the numbers that they're producing in the present. Uh, so, if you have any thoughts about how you think NVIDIA is, go NVIDIA is going to grow in the future, do leave a note in the comment section. I certainly have my thoughts, but those are my opinions. I'm not going to share them here because that's not the forum. Uh, but yeah, if you have any companies you would like us to analyze for you, do leave a note in the comment section. We always get round to them. Well, almost always get round to them. And as always, like, share, subscribe, particularly if you uh, made a request. As a subscriber, you will save a lot of time. YouTube will inform you when your video is ready. So until the next video, thank you, Ted. Thank you, everyone else. We'll see you on the next video. Thanks, Ted, Moe.